Well, I guess tonight we've, we've certainly heard to start off the, the growing demand for water on a, a global stage, um, issues with water scarcity, but I'd, I'd like to scope it down a little bit more to looking to what we're seeing locally or, or Canada-wide. And, and really posing the, the, the question once again of, you know, can we reach 2020 with the glass half full? I guess just to, to back up a little bit and, and talk a little bit about my role with the city, um, you know, there's, there's certain elements there, as you'd expect. There's technology testing. There's third-party performance testing of these technologies. Uh, there's planning with respect to our water future. There's knowing more about toilets than what is probably humanly healthy. Um, regardless, the, the biggest and most emerging component that we see here is, is facilitating social change. We're a mature community when it comes to water conservation. There's been a lot of great things that have happened here already. And uh, kudos to the, the community of Guelph for, for making that happen. But regardless, it's, it's no longer a technology-based solution, but we're moving to the integration of social and technology and recognizing social change as, as a metric in itself. The biggest barrier, that being said, is the idea of conservation somehow equaling sacrifice. You know, I think ethically, from a, from a personal point of view, to be wasteful with, with anything is uh, you know, frowned upon, um, viewed as wasteful in the larger scheme. However, when we apply that to personal resource use, for some reason there's a, a general thought that in turn we're, we're compromising the, the beauty of life, the things that we've really come to love, and as such you're, you're making it hard or taxing. I guess one example is, and I guess this won't work over the web feed, but if I were to ask everyone within this room today to, to reduce your personal water use by 20%, perhaps a show of hands to say, you know, I feel that's achievable. Okay, I'm speaking as a converted, you've ruined my point. <laughs> Regardless, um, in the truth of the matter, you know, it's very easy from a technology standpoint to curve our water use within the home. Um, even taking into account some of these smaller habitual changes, you'll reach that outcome. However, at the city of Guelph, we, we've set a goal of 20% as a community. So when you start thinking of all the end uses, the way we're using water on a day-to-day -day basis, it becomes much more complex. And really the need for conservation in the city of Guelph, and, and we've heard already, is we are an aquifer-based community, a groundwater-based community. All the water that we've had or, or ever will have is here today. Putting that in, in context as well, we're a significantly growing community. Since 1999, we've added 20,000 people to our community, and we haven't brought a new source of water supply on since 1996. So that being said, we've, we've bridged a gap. We, I'll show you some, some more specifics with that um, coming forward. However, you know, looking to both how we've grown and, and where we're growing moving ahead, adding 50,000 people and 31,000 more jobs by 2031, we're still coexisting on that same source. So in, in recognizing that we have a finite source and that the environment is a user as well, we have to be very strategic moving ahead as to how we do this. One of the key issues that we're battling as well is the myth of abundance. We as Canadians hear all the time of our, our water riches, that we have the, the largest source of fresh water in the world that in turn you know, is reflected through things such as pricing structures within this company which, or a country which help to or perpetuate um, a lot of these items. But we see it as well in the work that we're doing in, in, in the city and, and really starting to position what we're doing to best serve the public. We're doing more and more social market research than ever. Within the course of a focus group, uh, some of the initial questions that we're asking is, you know, what is the importance of conservation within your household? What actions have you taken? A lot of the time, the, the first thing that are, things that are coming up in the course of that conversation is, you know, I've, I've put CFLs in my house. We've replaced the windows. There's now... Um, insulation as, as part of our home, it's doing great. But we have to intervene and seriously curve that conversation to even bring water to the forefront. Even then, people's mindset seems to be very much based in energy. If we look to the Canadian Water Attitude study, a Unilever study from 2010, some of these points seem to back this up as well. One third of Canadians, or, or Canadians surveyed through that, pardon me, um, identified a third of the amount of water they actually use as what they believe they use in a day. One quarter of Canadians couldn't identify their public water source, where they were getting their drinking water as a community. And when talking to threats of, of drinking water or availability of fresh water, only 16% thought that in some way overuse was going to compromise their source. So certainly there's a long way to go on this front. We've heard a lot about climate change already this evening. 
And certainly it's important on all fronts to take actions if we can to mitigate climate change. However, the climate change discussion is, is very direct. You know, it, it's by design, that being said, such that when you're designing a public education program, you want to put easily communicated achievable actions in place such that we're achieving an end. However, you know, I like to give the public some credit. We're all very knowledgeable people. We can start to define some of the co-benefits associated with this, and, and one is really the relationship between water and energy. As a city, we represent, and, and as water services and wastewater services in the city, we represent 30% of the city's total electrical demand. For every cubic meter or 1,000 liters of water that comes to your home, is consumed and in turn treated at a wastewater treatment plant, we have just over one kilowatt hour of, of energy invested in that source amongst chemicals which have an invested energy source as well. This becomes even more pertinent when you start to think of 16 million cubic meters in the course of a year as a city. So really looking to climate change once again in the relationship between water and energy, it's very important both from a mitigation and an adaptation point of view. Looking to mitigation, there's the potential to you know, reduce the amount that we're using today, as such reducing our, our energy intensity and our GHG emissions. But looking to the future and the unknowns of climate change, we have the opportunity to lessen our, our given um, dependency on both water and energy and create reserves for the unknowns of the future that are yet to come forward. And what's climate change without a doomsday scenario? So here we go. <laughs> I guess certainly we all remember the, uh, the power outage of 2003. Um, Looking short term, I guess we all remember flooding patio bars in our respective communities until we learned that it was too long and, and in turn we'd have to return home and, and start burning some candles. But regardless, it's, it, it's a good example such that I think personally to the way that I was still walking into rooms and flipping on light switches and, and giving the, you know, under the breath, damn, like that's still happening. But regardless, when you, when you start to apply this scenario to water, you know, Looking to energy, you, you learned what new given unpossibilities there were in the world, which habits were compromised. The lesson here that, you know, certainly communities, the, the civilizations or, or foundations of communities were founded on the given relation to water. Water is very important to everything that we're doing. We can live without energy. And there were no civilizations that were formed around a light bulb by any means. I guess moving, moving to the next point, you know, we have all kinds of tools as far as moving forward right now. And, and, and at this point, you know, many people are looking for the silver bullet. And I'm going to tell you tonight that the silver bullet is not there. Certainly there's some great actions that you can take. You're targeting the lo largest water use in whatever respective environment you're doing. Moving down the, the list in, in more of a continuous improvement model that you have, you know, the, the largest given source and you're focusing your efforts as you go on from there. But really, to, to make these things work, there's a number of pieces that need to come together. There is integration, and all these actions do make a difference. And we have to recognize that they are interrelated in the end, and that the benefits aren't going to come from one sole action. In the city of Guelph, we've, we've shown the benefit of this already. Um, since 1999, we've been employing separate forms of, of conservation with a real increase in, in what's happening and a, and a more fulsome um, given program since 2006. Over this period, once again, we've added 20,000 people to the city, and I'll, I'll just go over the lines here. The, the light blue line, as you see, is, is average day production, so the t total amount on average that we're producing as a city each day throughout that year. The green line is population, and the purple line that you see here is the absolute worst day of the year. So we're constructing infrastructure so to provide water for those one or two days a year where everyone decides that in turn I'm turning on my hose or, or what it might be. Over the course of this period, we've reduced average day water use as far as looking at it as a total annual volume by 7.8 million cubic meters a year. To put this in perspective, this is enough for 73 days worth of current capacity as a city. To think that we've successfully saved enough to essentially provide our city with a quarter of a year worth of water is pretty impressive over this period. In addition, the peak days, as you can see, have drastically reduced. What this does is instead of us building infrastructure to in turn satisfy demand on two, three, four, or five days a year, instead we're able to you know, further refine that, bring it down, and utilize it such that we're not building excess infrastructure 
for things that are only happening periodically. Now, this, this might seem, you know, to counter to most logics such that you'd expect further population to drive further water use. But really, our, our, given, uh, pardon me, our, our given opportunity to decouple these two resources have added up to significant benefits. We've avoided $9.6 million of infrastructure as a community just simply to supply excess demand. We've cut our, our given energy intensity by over $130,000 a year. But in light of these accomplishments, we still have more to do. While City Council endorsed a, a water supply master plan in 2006, which aims to reduce the city's water use by 20% by 2025. In addition, we've been provided with the marching orders through the Community Energy Initiative to use less water and energy than any comparable city in Canada. I'm happy to report that of the first time-based goals of the Water Supply Master Plan, we've successfully already saved 12% by 2010. But really, our, our job is becoming harder. We're, we're a mature community. Um, people get the message. And a lot of the programs that we're undertaking now are the first of their kind in Canada, looking to gray water reuse, looking to rainwater harvesting, looking to some of the water intensity mapping works that we're now undertaking as far as further you know, identifying where there might be potential in the course of our community and really undertaking some targeted communication and direct communication such that we're not blanketing the community with a given message anymore. We understand that people have specific needs and have specific um, given needs as far as facilitating that water use or that reduction over time. So with this in, it, with this in mind, 2020 looks bright or achievable, but at the same time, we still have some work to do. So what does 2020 look like? It could look much like today. Essentially, the choice is ours at this time. What we do need to do, however, is to recognize the value of the resource we have and what tomorrow looks like if it's no longer available. For as Thomas Fuller said, we never know the worth of water, pardon me, till the well is dry.